Welcome to the Austin Cloud User Group 12 Clouds of Christmas. Yay. All right, boy, I see a bunch of new faces today. Welcome. Uh, basically, we're a user group. What you see is what you get. Uh, I'm, I'm Ernest Muller uh, with National Instruments. My fellow uh, uh, co-conspirators are uh, Oscar with BioWare and Craig with UT. Um, wave to the populace. Very good. Uh, welcome. So, uh, how did everybody hear about this? Because apparently it's not the normal mailing list because you're all new. <laughs> Cloud Security. Ah, uh, Cloud Security Alliance. Yes. Uh, oh, outstanding. How about uh, other stuff? I got an email from a <coughs> meetup group. Meetup. So, we started advertising via meetup as well. Let me, uh, let me write up here the. We do a meetup, we do an event right, we put it on, you know, everything. But if you want to be put in the main vein of goodness, join the Google group mailing list. It's not real high traffic, it's basically high traffic about these. Uh, uh, these meetings with occasional discussions when I try to spur them. Uh, feel free and uh, sign up. Welcome to everybody. So uh, this time we're, uh, we we change up the format each time because it's a user group. We're just doing whatever uh, whatever strikes is an entertaining uh, thing to do at the time. So today is the 12 clouds of Christmas. We've got a bunch of lightning demos planned. Um, we're targeted at about five minutes, but if they're swapping in and out, and things are just going great. Uh, you know, we can probably slice a couple extra minutes out of there. I think we should have just about 12 since we have some standbys and some cancellations. Uh, so that's awesome. Uh, I'd like to thank Bizarre Voice for sponsoring the food and beer and cookies today. Um, oh, let's see. Uh, with that, we probably shouldn't. Uh, around too much, uh, we should probably launch right into it, but I know, uh, speaking of Cloud Security Alliance, ah, there we go, uh, glad we have an announcement. Yeah, uh, we're starting up a Cloud Security Alliance chapter in Austin, I'm Glenn Roberts, the president, we've got a lot of people involved, uh, so if you'd like to join us, our first meeting is January the 25th, and uh, we're targeting the fourth, let me get this right, the fourth Wednesday first kickoff, uh, you know, there'll be a door prize, there'll be a Kindle Fire. Uh, who knows where we go with it from there as far as door prizes. Probably not uh, much more than uh, food and stuff, but you're uh, welcome to join us over here. So uh, AustinCloud.org is the uh, website for it. Uh, Set that up for you. Uh, January the 25th. <laughs> Thanks, well, that's, uh, that's good. I know uh, I, both, both James and I have uh, been happy followers of the uh, Cloud Security Alliance. They do good stuff, and it's uh, great to see a chapter get started here in Austin. Uh, does anybody else have uh, <coughs> announcements and or general statements of interest to, to the group? All righty then. Well, uh, there will no further ado. Our first presenter is going to be uh, Chris from uh, Bizarre Voice, and you, you can see your uh, your batting order here. Probably whoever's next wants to come get in the on deck circle. You know what I'm saying with all that American baseball and stuff. <coughs> um, there's still uh, there's still pizza and beer out there, soda and cookies uh, over here. Muscle your way through them, but uh, enjoy. So, uh, Chris with as always, what I'm going to go over is just a very high level overview of how we integrated our physical data center and our cloud data center. It's kind of in a rush to prepare for Black Friday. Uh, as always, is a, I'll call it a social marketing company, so we are a SaaS provider that does ratings and reviews, questions and answers, a lot of the stars and reviews and things you see embedded in effect, like Best Buy, Open Table. Um, that's all a SaaS product running in Java on the back end that gets injected into your site. Uh, we do a lot of high traffic sites that are kind of unpredictable. We don't always know when a client's going to have a sale or what product's going to be very popular. Um, because we're directly injected, if we don't plan for that appropriately and the site goes down, then our client site has a pretty bad effect. Uh, the problem we 
we ran into recently is Black Friday. So now we have Black Friday, Cyber Monday, and apparently it was a Green Tuesday as well. I wasn't aware of that. Um, <laughs> so every year we see about a 50% bump of <coughs> origin. We're a heavy cash user, a heavy CDN user. We see about a 50% bump to origin um, from Black Friday traffic and, and really through the weekend. This year we decided to add uh, some pain to it. We also tried to drop our TTL on CDN to attack another 30% on top of that. So all in all, we were expecting when we saw that 95% Uh, the infrastructure we were hosting that with was two data centers. We had a primary data center that's physical and old iron and things like that. And we had Amazon as a backup. So Amazon was not live, was not serving traffic. Uh, each of these data centers is running you know, the basic Java stack, uh, Apache and Tomcat. We have OpenMQ, Solar, MySQL for messaging, indexing, content, and databases, and things like that. And the data centers were essentially mirrors. Amazon was scaled back a little bit. Again, it was just a failover of the data center. Um, but we shard based on MySQL size and performance, so when a particular cluster starts to hit some limits, that's when we'll shard out to another cluster. And each cluster contains either app server, source servers, and two servers, things like that. So the problem with that is a primary physical data center is very slow to add capacity. So it takes us roughly two to three weeks if we want to add capacity to a data center, and each one of those servers comes with commitments and contracts and things like that. And I apologize, that's black, but it's a little bit difficult to be in the background. Um, our cloud <coughs> at Amazon was a manual failure. So we'd have to update DNS, wait for that to cash time out, to be able to expire, and then traffic would move over to Amazon. And we didn't have a good solution. This has no problem on that account. We didn't have a good solution for scaling Amazon automatically. So what we did is a thing we called cloud modules. Um, and a module for us is a pool of related servers. So it's display databases, indexing servers, uh, application servers. Um, that gives us a known capacity, so we know how much traffic we can handle with that module. And all that stuff sits behind uh, pairs of HA proxy messages so we can add them and remove them put out in one uh, As I said, each of those stacks runs our standard stack uh, with the addition of uh, MySQL read databases. And we coordinate with Puppet and NOAA. So Puppet is used for managing configurations between servers so they're all aware of each other. And we chose NOAA to do actual the distributed coordination and to add things, or to use to add things into HA proxy. NOAA is a minimalist port of Zookeeper. Um, we chose that. I think Zookeeper is probably the right answer to go and back with and reevaluate that. NOAA was a very simple way to do it real fast. So we added NOAA on that one. Um, so the solution we have now, we use Rundeck to coordinate scaling things up. We can just kind of click a button. Rundeck fires up a bunch of instances. They get ramped up. Puppet does configuration. Uh, there's scripts that interact with NOAA and get things in behind AJ proxy. And then Rundeck continues on to copy over some databases and more caches. So I know that was really high level and there's no examples, but I can't. We only have that existing in production, so I can't do that as I can know. Um, the other thing we did in this scenario is we didn't want to have two data centers and active in the backup with one not doing anything. So we did global server load balancing. Um, and so what this does, this allows you to route traffic at the DNS layer um, and have it go to multiple data centers. Um, part of this is it picks the data center that's closest to the user, and it's also monitoring your performance. So if you have a data center that gets slow or gets bad, traffic will be pulled away from that. Um, the way that kind of works in our stack is an end user requests a page and they have to do a DNS lookup. That DNS lookup is going to be our caching provider. Um, their DNS server is going to forward that and try and find an A record for the data center to serve this content. That A record is actually available from multiple places on the internet, and internet routing takes care of it going to the best one. And that's kind of a key part of DNS routing because this decision about which data, which DNS server is closest to you, is how DNS routing decides they're close to you. And it doesn't always apply. So when that decision is made, you know, you've got the end user and the request is made to our caching provider. And the caching provider checks and says, all right, do I have this content? If yes, I'll hand it back. Uh, if not, I'm going to have to do another lookup and they're going to look up our origin server to figure out where they need to request content. So we do the same thing to them that they do to our end users. We do any cast DNS and we do routing based on DNS. So Caching provider does a lookup, and when the caching provider's DNS forwarder sends the request that it looks for the DNS entry for the authoritative server, the server that answers is actually aware of our environment. So it knows the regions that we have data centers in, and it knows the health of those data centers. So the answer it gives is based on the location of the person doing the request. So it says, all right, you're in London, or you're in San Francisco, or you're in Australia. And it's going to return an A record based on that. But before it does that, it's actually going to decide on the region that way, then it's going to consult a local traffic manager. And what this local traffic manager is doing is it's actually loading client pages on a website. It's measuring response times. It's measuring availability. And it's going to return the best data center at that given time. So we keep a, a pretty short TTL on these things. So every time
send that TTL to the device is made again from the caching provider. Uh, and so you're always going to get the closest to the best data center. We found that uh, some people like mobile users, DNS servers tend not to be zero mobile users. Uh, there's a number of servers more people like people that use public DNS like Google, HID, 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 HID. Your DNS service can be on the other side of the world. And everything that uses this type of localization is going to assume that you're where the DNS server is. So you'll see things like uh, Netflix. If you use Netflix at home and you do HID, 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 Persistence, there's no cookies that work with that. So a user can submit content, it can enter into one data center, then their immediate read right after that can go to a whole other data center and get different results and the content's not there. So you either have to be in an environment where that's tolerable or you have to put them around that. Uh, the other problem is there are no sessions. So if you have users that have to log in and associate with a particular server, their next request could go to the other side of the world because you really can't predict where the DNS things are going to go. Um, it's been pretty consistent for us, and I've seen some other reports where people have actually measured, and if they say it's 90 to 95% accurate, you'll get the same data center every time as it's close to that end user. So, uh, this actually worked out really well for us. Um, Cyber Monday ended up being our biggest day. We did 3.3 billion requests at the edge that day. We peaked about 54,000 requests per second, and we served 28 terabytes of content. Um, we saw a huge offload on our caching provider. Um, very, very large, which means that people were kind of consolidating on the same pages and everyone seemed to be directing the gifts for Christmas this year. <laughs> <laughs> we contributed to serve content 50-50, so we were half in our physical data center and half in the cloud one. Um, we ran both of them up to be kind of end one, so if one died, the other could handle all the traffic. We did some outage tests where we just took a data center offline, and we found that it took about three minutes for the system to completely just isolate that data center. <coughs> it took about 60 seconds, because that's the polling interval for the safety check. It took 60 seconds for the whole system to kind of react, and then another 60 seconds is thrown in there for the actual DNS TCL. You're waiting for people to update DNS for that change to become active. So in a super high level with no interesting demo, that is kind of the overview of how we handle Black Friday and how we started bridging our two data centers together. Some things we're going to do differently is we're going to evaluate Zookeeper a little more in depth. Um, we're going to move to probably closer to Amazon native tools like EWD, EPC, things like that, so we can get dynamic scaling without us hitting a button to scale that up. Uh, are we doing questions or are we just kind of rolling through these? You're welcome to get to this. I'll do a few questions. What was the performance of Amazon? I'm thinking about Amazon having to revision for the peak peak of the year, right? That, that Black Friday. So we didn't run into any problems with that. So that's been a concern <coughs> in the past, and we've definitely, we, we had a big concern. That was one of the drivers for us ramping our physical data center up to 100%, was this is, everybody is doing this with Amazon, right? So if there was going to be a failure, like the recent one we saw in the West, or at least it was going to cascade. Um, so we kind of planned ahead for that, but they ended up losing right there with no problem. Give your time constraints. Why don't you go with ELB, RDS, uh, stuff like that from the start? <laughs> the big thing was we already had the backup data center in place, and it was already using HA proxy and things like that. So we just kind of built on that, and now we have active projects to go back and, and kind of undo that spaghetti and, and do it what we consider to be the right way, which is awesome. So before I turn it over, I'm going to beg for engineers. <laughs> So we're hiring, this stuff is growing really fast. We're seeing a 50% growth every year in our origin traffic, and we're starting to spread out to multiple data centers. This was two, we're working on three, and then we're going to go five, ten. We're, we're branching out pretty fast. So our ops team is under a lot of pressure to keep up with development and a lot of new features. So we're hiring cloud architects, which are people who kind of work on this type of thing, like design how we're going to use Amazon tools, how we're going to do internal private cloud for QA and testing and all. DevOps engineers actually work directly with development teams to design the product and make sure that it scales and handles multiple data centers and things like that. And then infrastructure engineers kind of tie it all together, handle networking, load balancing, and actual deployment and release. <coughs> uh, it's always a pretty awesome place to work. Uh, we have multiple K-graders. <laughs> we, <do. laughs> we had two, and I think I've actually kind of four at this point. Some people are like reeling them into their pods and covering them. So. Um, we do 20% time, very similar to how Google does it. So you get personal time to work on something that's, you know, professional <coughs> development, something that's annoying you that you just want to get knocked out, or something that you want to get benefit from. There's really, this is a great thing. There's like no reporting on it. You just kind of work on stuff. Of time. We have unlimited vacation, which is very awesome. And we're consistently raised one of the best places to work in Austin. Uh, and that's all I have. So if you guys have 
Anything you want to discuss on this? Questions, suggestions, anything on the technical side, or any interest in any of the divisions we have open? Uh, again, that's kind of hard to read if it's black on green, huh? That's Christopher.pro at resolvies.com, or you can just uh, hit me up on Twitter at CCRO, if you don't remember, CK Rock. Well. So. All right. Timekeeping, so I'll uh, look if you're presenting, look over at me, and I'll give you some obscene gestures. But I always like looking at you, so. It's <laughs> <coughs> who you are and what you're presenting. Hey, I'm James Wicket. We're going to be talking about uh, Vagrant. Um, it's called uh, your personal cloud, so it's a, a gift uh, uh, for Christmas here. <clears throat> oh, and by the way, we have a volunteer uh, recording the sessions. If you are in your presentation, I don't know, you have something secret and don't want it to record it, let us know. <laughs> hey, okay, yeah, so uh, doing a talk on Vagrant, that's the uh, your personal cloud, and uh, they can get a hold of me on Twitter at Wicked. Um, but I want to, let's start with our protagonist, and our protagonist, business uh, Bob here, uh, is spreading over the team's project. He's got cloud costs rising, he has uh, testing that, that doesn't replicate real environments, and uh, really there's some frustration going on there. So he reminds us that you know he looks happy, but he's really upset. And uh, uh, he meets uh, our good friend uh, Vagrant, and it sounds like there might be something that can happen here. So Vagrant, from their website, they say that they're a tool uh, for building and distributing virtualized development environments. And they offer all sorts of neat features like coded, coding your infrastructure, lets you do automation, uh, easy setup networking, SSH access to the boxes, comes as a Ruby gem, so if you're running on RBM, uh, that even that even makes it working a little bit better. So uh, business Bob, he's sold. He says, "All right, it's good. It's open source. Um, it's automation friendly, and it's going to be helping my team get get uh, get going with testing." All right, so let's take a quick look at uh, at Vagrant. Uh, this demo uh, is a pretty quick demo, but basically, it's, I'm running the RBM uh, Ruby version manager uh, on my box with Ruby. I'm running 1.93. Uh, and you have to get a virtual box, I'm running 418, uh, but I think you have to have one of the 401 branches to get it to work. Vagrant reminds me on their website that, hey, it's a beta, it may not always, uh, may not always uh, work if you kind of use the old stuff. Uh, you can also, like I said, use RVM, but then Chef, there's some provision uh, structures inside of Vagrant as well to make it cool. All right, so we're going to do a little bit this like uh, a kitchen uh, <coughs> show. Uh, and we're gonna, I'm going to talk through the first ones, and then we're going to switch over to command line and, and run some stuff. But Vagrant simply comes to the gem, so you just do your gem install Vagrant. Uh, then you can add some boxes. Uh, I've added uh, two boxes here. Uh, one, a web box, and this is a, uh, a Linux uh, Ubuntu box. And then I have a Vagrant box uh, called OWASP WT. That's our test box. So really the scenario here is you have a, a web box that's uh, your front end, and then you're trying to run some tests against it. You initialize your environments. Uh, and then you can turn Vagrant up. Before we go through that, let's see. To VirtualBox. So we're going to be able to watch this kind of as it goes real time. So I've, I've already virtualized my environment, but I went ahead and suspended it. So you can see it's not running right now. Vagrant file. So the Vagrant file is the file that kind of tells Vagrant who it is, what it's running is. And uh, whenever you start with Vagrant on their website, there's like five commands, gets you going pretty quick. Uh, but we're setting up a two box infrastructure here, so that way we can know, uh, you know, kind of do some networking tests and, and do kind of a simple demo here. Set up a web box, and uh, you've already imported the box uh, previously, but you can set up port forwarding for it, and you can configure a network uh, address space for it. And we also define a OWASP uh, web testing. Uh, We're going to first start in 
just turn Vagrant on, and you just issue a Vagrant up after you already get it uh, initialized, and it's going to go ahead and start booting up the VM, um, and we'll flip over to virtual box to see it. And uh, actually, didn't flip fast enough, but they went from saved uh, suspended state to the running state. And so you can do cool things like. Uh, Now I'm uh, on the command line of the uh, actual box itself, and I'm able to do that. Um, because we set up the network, and it's just the default uh, Apache web server, didn't put anything special on it, but uh, we're going to put that on there. So we've got the two boxes running. Uh, we're going to go ahead and say uh, and this basically takes your machines and went ahead and saved them, suspended them. And then once I'm done with development, now I can go ahead and check in my uh, bigger file uh, and uh, do source control and all that kind of stuff on it. Uh, but now we're just going to end the demo. It, and we're going to walk away, and uh, yeah. we'll be done. So, any questions on Vagrant? <coughs> All right, if you want the slides later, they're going to be on uh, the Agile Admin, and uh, appreciate it. talking about uh, jcloud, which is uh, a Java API. Um, when Ernest brought up the subject uh, phone cloud for Christmas, so I immediately thought of jcloud because it's a Java API that supports a number of cloud providers. So I figured I could do 12,001. And it's just, an API, it's just a Java API, so no slides, just code. No, I don't have a lot of time, so just code. Um, if you want to see who it supports, uh, they have a nice provider API here that you can just query the, query the API itself. You can tell me who the, all the all the compute. So there's two main parts of the API. There's compute, which is like EC2 instances of virtual machines. And then there's also blob store, which is like Amazon S3, uh, Azure blob storage. So these are the, the compute uh, providers that actually support the CMs on EC2, directly cloud servers, and all the different locations that they have different features and implementations. So <coughs> again, it's, a, it's an API. They want to provide a consistent look and feel to across all the cloud providers. So the idea is that it would be portable. <coughs> so we're just going to show that with uh, with their uh, blob API here. So you'll notice it's tied over and over with uh, JCloud. Uh, you get a context that has your, uh, you know, your, your uh, provider token here, and then your, your uh, credentials. Um, you get a context, you get, a, get the service, and then you go ahead and do your work. And all the blob stores are you know, container and objects, or bucket and objects, or what have you. Know, uh, JCloud calls them uh, containers and blobs. Let me go ahead and run this on uh, Amazon. And I'm going to get the, uh, the URL for that. but I expected it not to work. <laughs> uh, 
why I like it better than Beckett. So, this makes it pretty easy here. Um, let's see, if I want to do this against Azure, all I do is change, change that uh, provider token. Now I have to go back and take care of this. So I go back to my code and you're out of time. Could you get a bonus 60 seconds? What? I'm out of time already. I'm, time. To, I'm not going to even get to the computer. Bonus Sorry. 60 seconds. <laughs> so to drill in to the uh, <laughs> specific ones, you can see it's the same kind of pattern, but I get my contacts and then I cast it to an Amazon contact, an Amazon client. Now I can drill in and I can get an S3 object, estimate it just how I want to. I'm going to set that, grab it, put it with an NPL, public read. Yeah. Tell them about the groups real quick. Alright. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so the cool feature, on, the really cool feature on um, the queue, so that's, that's, that's Bob. I wanted to show kind of the, the general provider API and show you how to give you a link to that. Features there, but um, with compute service, the feature I found really compelling was the grouping. And that is, you can see a similar pattern here. I get a context, I get the service, you know, I can get a, I get a template, and, and that's, that's pretty cool. It just works. You, know, you get the smallest, you go to image and template out there on, on Amazon, and fire up three of them here. You know, I'll group them in that group there. But then later on, I can uh, manipulate them as a group, so I can take query out of there, give me all those EXP web ones that I just created, and I can uh, run scripts on them, I can start them, stop them, suspend them, terminate them, all that, and I'm not going to run any of this, but uh, a lot of other cool features, so let's just scratch on the surface, jcloud.org, and uh, all the source codes out on GitHub, so check it out.
Unfortunately, I would like to show you more about the actual demo, but uh, it's so beta, 
Actually, it will start. I can actually show you it will start up, but I can't secure shell into it. And uh, it actually never joins my Condor pool either. So the developer, he says he's still trying to work on that functionality of getting the node to uh, come back and connect back to the cluster. Uh, but even beyond that, I think this is important because if you know the magic XML, uh, there's no reason why you couldn't make rocks host any sort of cluster or any sort of appliance you want. In fact, that's one of the things I'm doing now is I'm working on having all the different non rocks Unix servers that I have to manage to be rocks capable. So my MySQL servers, my Apache servers, everything. Uh, and that way, uh, I don't have to patch anymore. I don't have to install things. I just tell Locks, hey, spin off a new MySQL server. Uh, and then that also makes it nice because the whole point of this is once you have a custom appliance, the whole point is to be able to easily push that appliance up into the cloud without having to mess around with uh, Puppet and whatnot or Chef. And that's pretty much it. Thank you. Something new that Salesforce put together called, called Chatter. I think they're really trying to get uh, involved in the whole mixing social media with uh, client relationship management. So they started this whole Chatter thing, um, which looks real similar to like, Facebook and, and uh, other, other social media tools. Uh, and you can see information about cases and then, uh, you know, you can post kind of what you're working on. And, and I think the idea is to get everybody to interact. You also get this dashboard of, of the things that you know are really important to you. This is my dashboard. I, I manage our support team, so kind of like you see what they're working on. We're not, we don't have a really big team. We only have about 60 people working in Austin, so we're only five people on the support team. So I just, you know, when you log in, you get to see whatever you want in the dashboard, and you can customize this page. Uh, so if you click on the dashboard, you can actually see some reports of the actual cases that, that we're working on. So the reporting system is actually really pretty good in Salesforce. I think that's the, the thing we like most about it. It's pretty easy to build new dashboards, build new reports. Um, it's really flexible. So if I want to edit this report, I can, you know, right now the columns that I have are but
working with and the chatter team, which is uh, something new that they've added. Uh, we just, uh, you know, people just what, what they what they're doing, uh, and you can, you know, like and comment or unlike them. I think today we noticed that you can like your own comments, or, which is a little <laughs> different than on Facebook. <laughs> Dashboards are also really cool. Um, so we've got a number of dashboards that we've built just to give us different views on what's going on with, with our group. And they're pretty simple to build. Um, and once you kind of dive, dive deeper into the dashboard, you can see more details about what was used to build that particular dashboard. That's sort of what's been, uh, you know, really great about Salesforce. I, I don't, I'm not making any money off of Salesforce. I'm not really, uh, I'm not trying to sell this thing. It's just, uh, you know, been a really useful tool. And I think, it, I think, you know, everybody knows that Salesforce has kind of just, you know, been a, uh, you know, one of the applications that's kind of pushed the cloud uh, and made it a lot more. Accessible to a common person has a concept of it, and it's also kind of the granddaddy of the, the cloud application. Um, when we look at an actual you know, client case, you can see these, these, uh, this information on top is sort of what's standard for Salesforce. And then we've added a bunch of different, you know, <coughs> a lot of our, of our own uh, uh, fields that are specific to our clients. So we have all the development <coughs> when we're starting development. We do a lot of development projects for our clients, so that's been pretty easy to add um, in Salesforce. So another uh, uh, thing I'd like to show is just their, the Salesforce's status window. So this is how we, you know, Salesforce's platform perfect, it slows down every once in a while. So the first thing we'll do is check the system status and you can tell which instance we're on a one using this trust.salesforce.com status page and you can see that we they did have trouble with uh, you know they had some issues a, a few days ago and things slowed down so you kind of always look here uh, sometimes when the whole thing you know shuts down I'll just check Twitter and see what's going on because a lot of people will start complaining because that's I mean I use this page but I'll also kind of just check the, the Twitter feed to see what's going on because that's People get pretty irate. Uh, <coughs> that's pretty much it. I mean, that's Salesforce in a nutshell. Does anyone have any questions? It, is all of this completely internal, or, or portions of this like exposed? They, to they have a they have a, a portal, um, one that you can buy that will really give you the clients pretty much the exact same view that we get, and then there's the one that's free that that's the one we use. It they basically just get to see a very limited. thing is that we're actually the only group that's using Salesforce, so they're, you know, our parent company one from Chicago, they use QuickSage and some other tools that they built internally. For the sales side, they built the, the system entirely on their own, and when they acquired us, there was talk of us having to move to all those other like, internal tools and QuickSage, but we were able to, you know, fight to keep Salesforce, and I think now they're kind of like,
Thanks for doing that. Like, you know, you, you always hear of Salesforce as being, you know, one of the big SaaS players, but if you've never worked for a company that uses Salesforce, it's like, well, I've heard of it, but they're not what is all this? That's true with Heroku. Uh, my day job is I work for Dell. Um, my presentation tonight is about Google Apps. So one of the fun things for me is I can talk about something that I don't use at work. <laughs> and uh, so hopefully give you a biased uh, opinion. I, I got interested in App Engine a while ago, and the best way to learn something is to actually do it. So last year, I set about porting um, a uh, comment form. Their actual sample app is a comment form. I have a comment form that I've been running for my wife since 1995. It's like the oldest like, active uh, comment form on the internet. Um, so we were going to port it to Google App Engine, and this is this is a, this is the code that I set up last year to do it. I'll, I'll make some tweaks to it. Google App Engine, as a definition, is a Platform is a service play. It is basically Google, you give your code packages to Google in Google App Engine, you upload them, and it executes it for you. It actually provides a load balancer. It brings web traffic right to your app, and then it executes the app. The app can be in Java, it can be in Python. Um, actually, I think they've expanded to some other languages. Those are the primary ones. For the Java pieces, which I'm going to show here, it uses the model view controller. Uh, paradigm using Java service pages, so you basically package up your jars and upload it. Uh, and there's a uh, Eclipse plugin that makes this very, very easy. So I'll, I'll walk you through that. The thing that's important to understand about a platform as a service is that it's not so much about the way you upload the code. It's about all of the services that your code can leverage because it's in that environment. So the, the thing that I found really exciting about Google App Engine and that I've been really impressed with Google about is the real breadth of services they put behind your ability to execute code. So just writing code is one thing, but being able to take advantage of a blob store and a memcache server and a table store and uh, OAuth, namespaces, mail, uh, their caching service, XMPP, uh, task queues, there's an amazing breadth of services that if you weren't using a platform as a service provider, you would have to spin up yourself if you wanted to leverage them. Uh, so that's been one of the very interesting things about <coughs> being able to use something like Google App Engine. So in bringing up this application, I didn't have to write a table store. I needed one. I just used the one that came embedded in Google. And then one of the things that's interesting is that then I have some really nice tools. And I'll tell you, last year, this is this dashboard has come a long way, and it, it, they make a lot of progress on it. But I can actually come in here and see the see the traffic that I have on, on a regular basis. I can see the instances that I've deployed. Uh, right now, I haven't been hitting the site, so it's spun it down, right? Which is exactly what the way you're going to get billed if you get traffic. So <coughs> it's a really nice way to put together a test site really fast. If you're just writing an app, it's, people use Heroku the same way. It's really easy for, for that. Um, and the way migrations are handled is I can actually upload different instances. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. So uh, this, oh, I'll show you what the code looks like. Circa 1995 design. <laughs> I did add the FTK editor about five years ago. Uh, yeah, it's one of those things. Hey, honey, you, know, you rewrite the code on the weekend and everybody's happy. Um, but basically what happens is that you can just, you click in, it gets a post, you add a post. Uh, it's going to spin up my Google App Engine image, and then I can put in some comments and, and there we go. And that's exactly what I've got here. <coughs> not a very, not a very complex web app, but it's enough that you can get a feel for how things operate. So uh, basically, I've got some back-end objects like a post to store data, and then 
I actually have a post servlet to do the control rendering for it. And then down here I have all the view pages that work behind it. So what I've done here is in my header, I added, I'll add APUG, and I'm going to change my version from 7 to 8. So one of the things that is really significant in how this operates is it operates on the same on the same premise that any massive scale deployment rollout does. So you actually version your upgrade, what will happen is it's going to come here, it's going to stage the work, it's going to take all of the code that I've got, package it up, put it into a jar file, send it up to Google, and it's going to show up <coughs> in time in my dashboard right here as a new instance. What I can do, and this is one of the really cool things about a platform as a service and the way Google App, this is, Google App Engine isn't the only one who stages things like this. Um, and a lot of uh, large scale development operations are doing exactly the same thing. But what I can do is I can do a test run on this, on the new instance which should come up as eight. And I can actually do a full test, I can do a, a run on it. It's gonna use the same data stores underneath the covers so I can get a complete version of that and then when I'm ready to switch it over, I can just come in here and say click, make it the default, and it will become the new running application. If I don't like it, I can switch back. And therefore, I can sort of do this integrative testing where I can put new code out there, I can start working it, I can make it make sure it goes. If I don't like it, I can go back. This is one of the things I found very compelling with this. The other thing I found that was really nice was I can actually come in and look at all the data stores. So I can I can say, oh, I, I want to see all the posts. And this will actually has all the posts. Um, so I can actually inspect the data stores really easily. So even though it's a, a backend store, I can come in and, and tweak the data and make, things, make sure things are right. And even though it's a flat table design, it does respect my column headers. So that, that seems, that, that's pretty straightforward. And then I get great, um, statistics and control, <coughs> excuse me, and, all, and how all this stuff is going. Um, and with App Engine, you can actually control your billing. So if you don't want to pay a lot of money, you can actually throttle your site so that it gets less performant. Um, if you want it to say, oh, I'm just going to spend $30 a month to provide this content, it'll throttle it back to you. It'll throttle, throttle back the, the amount of traffic you get. So that's, that's about as much as I can cover reasonably in five minutes. going to get slower to respond. So you're going you're to get progressively less or won't spin up your instances to hold it. And there's there's all sorts of interesting <coughs> wrinkles where if you have something running too long, it'll shut it down. Um, it's not stateless, so you have to use a uh, memcu, memcache. Um, but you know, from a prototyping, getting something up and running, it's fast, free, really easy, and if you need to scale, it takes care of scaling. Have you uh, noticed any delays in some kind of editing? There is. The first time you hit it, it's going to spin it up, so you'll get a delay. That's part of the contract. So it looks like you've used the uh, SO plugin a lot. Have you uh, had similar, uh, like a good experience with the SDK as well? I have, have not used their SDK at all. I just played with the SO plugin. So, and that, but that was a breeze. So I was actually up and pushing my first app there in just you know, a couple of hours. Guys, not my laptop, so I'm uh, struggling with a couple things here. So, uh, hi, my name is George. Uh, I work out at uh, Electronic Arts. Today I'm here to talk about uh, right scale. Um, so, unlike the last presentation, uh, I'm going to be talking about infrastructure as a service, things like AWS, for example. Um, so, infrastructure as a service, right? Like at the end of the day with cloud, we're talking about getting some sort of usable service, right? So, software as a service, you are just going directly to it, you know, putting it in your inputs. Platform as a service, you're putting in your code. Infrastructure as a service, you're actually building everything from the ground up to build it out, right? So there are a number of steps that happen from the time that you swipe your credit card, you get your AWS account, and you have a usable application. A um, couple other things, actually, I want to say I completely misjudged what this group was going to be like. I thought it was going to be like five of us with like four other guys in some dark room. I would have
structure things a little bit differently, had I know. Uh, I also thought you guys were really against having slides and presentations, and there are two slides that really would have helped with this, but it says that on your wiki, so I'm going to talk through it instead. Aha, uh -huh, I'll take your wiki. Um, <laughs> so, uh, right scale. Uh, right scale is a good polish tool to uh, uh, get your usable application up in any infrastructure as a service type environment. Um, there are a uh, number of things that happen in building your application, right, with infrastructure and service. You have your base provisioning layer, right, whatever API interaction you are working with to get your VM, right, so you get a VM of a specific size with, you know, these network resources, right, it's basically like your virtual hardware component, right, so there's that, that base provisioning layer. Um, after that, you have a, a CMS, like a config management layer. Right, your OS, your packages, the things that you expect to write on, right, and how that all is managed. Then on top of that, there's an orchestration layer, right? How do you get your code from point A to point B? How do you make sure things start up in the right sequence and actually turn into this usable application? Um, right Field does all of those things kind of all in one. And there are multiple ways to skin this cat, and even within EA, there are multiple ways that we do this. This just happens to be a really polished product, and so we decided, hey, it would be good to show as an intro to this group, right? Um, uh, one of the things that we're doing at EA2 is uh, there's another problem that we're trying to solve, which is uh, you guys all know Electronic Arts, like EA Sports is some game, right? Like space video game type <coughs> of uh, There are, just because like there's one name to all the games doesn't mean the things are done the same way. And there's a really big city-state model at EA where, you know, if we deal with 30 different game development studios, they do things 35 different ways. Um, <laughs> so uh, one of the things that RightScale also allows us to do is um, give our end users a framework to uh, deploy their applications or manage their applications in a way that's centrally supportable. Um, the other problem that we're solving is that a number of our game studios um, started to go around the centralized IT model to deploy their applications into the cloud and would build these great, big, complex, convoluted stacks in an unsupportable, at least by IT fashion, and then say, hey, come here and support it, right? So the other thing that RightScale allows us to do is deliver um, templates of ways that we see your application <coughs> running or frameworks that are, plot, that, uh, are consistent with our IT policies, but that still allow you that same kind of flexibility that you want to talk about. Right? Um, so there are a lot of concepts to talk about here, and I'm just going to at least go through the way that this tool organizes those. And uh, RightScale, if, uh, if you guys are not familiar, RightScale's whole promise is uh, write your, your deployment once, Know, deploy into any cloud, right? Um, the truth of the matter is a little more convoluted than that, but that's at a, at a base what they deliver. And right scale uh, will interact with AWS, it interacts with AWS very well. By extension, it uh, interacts with Eucalyptus very well because the APIs are very, very similar. Um, it also works with uh, cloud.com, it works with Rackspace Cloud. And um, the way that you start to uh, deploy within those different frameworks is they have what they call multi-cloud images, right? These are all your AMIs. So in that in that model where we have like provisioning layer and your CMS layer and your orchestration, uh, I see a lot of folks that do all of that by baking everything into your AMI, right? You put in all your software packages, you put in maybe even your code, and the way that you make changes is you always update that AMI. Um, and that can work in very small scenarios, but in a scenario where we are you know, supporting 30, 40 different studios, it's even, you know, uh, if those applications have four or five AMIs, which is a very small base number, um, you know, multiply that out and it becomes very unruly, very unmanageable, very quickly. Um, and so one of the things that we strive for is having a very small generic set of components and then building them on the fly the way that we need them each time. So RightScale kind of does the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. You basically uh, create this multi-cloud definition uh, that says, hey, when, you know, I want to start up CentOS 5.4, for example, in any particular cloud, um, if you drill into this, you can kind of see some of the clouds that, you know, it supports, right? So when I am in Asia Pacific, Singapore, in AWS, right, use this particular image. And if you drill down into that, you, know, you can see what the, uh, the ID is for that um, particular volume, right? Like you've got your AMI ID. Um, and again, you know, you basically define every cloud with that list, then what am I starting when I call this particular multi-cloud image? Um, multi-cloud images are then 
uh, wrapped around a server template, right? And a server template is exactly what it sounds like. Um, it is, you know, kind of an abstract way to make that image into a usable form. Um, you do that all based on uh, write scripts. Um, so these scripts are basically anything that uh, can be executed on that image. Right scale can execute it for you. It organizes them into a couple of categories, which didn't appear on the screen the right way, but basically boot scripts, things that happen at boot, um, operational scripts, things that happen while this instance is running, and then decommissioning scripts, what happens when you shut this down. Right? So it's a really nice way to organize uh, your, uh, your particular workflow. So um, we'll drill down into one of these, um, and uh, I'll back up for a second here. You can see that we've taken a couple of basic server templates and organize them into what you know a deployment might look like. A couple of MySQL databases, a couple of different you know, uh, PHP web nodes and a Tomcat node. So if you drill into these, you can see they have different scripts, things that they do. I don't know if you guys can read that. Um, you know, this thing comes up, AMI updates, you know, software <coughs> security patches, these things come up all the time. Register in DDNS, blah, 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 you know, install users, install software, draft code, make yourself a usable member of this application. Um, we, uh, uh, we basically uh, uh, structure this so that uh, you can do a lot of things. Um, we're also a big puppet shop. Um, you can do things like this through puppet. You can do them through chef. You can do them through write scripts. Um, but this particular way is a nice way for um, our individual partners that we work with to see what these scripts are doing and have some flexibility in how those things get built. Um, all of these scripts have inputs, for example, that you can define at many levels, but um, you know, that will allow you to specify things like you know, a user that you want scripts to execute, et cetera. Um, it's <coughs> yet another way to create that uh, configura ma configuration management for you. Um, so you take all of those things, you wrap them up into one large uh, deployment. If I go back. Um, you uh, you know just structure your deployment in a, uh, in a way that looks like it's going to be usable to you. So you have multi-cloud images, your server template, which makes that something usable. Um, RightScale also uses array, and an array is basically calling that one same server template over and over and over again uh, with basic scaling parameters. And I know I'm running short on time, so I'll make this quick. Um, you know, you set the system <coughs> threshold. AWS now does this, and now AWS supports scaling natively. Um, however, uh, uh, RightScale pioneered that logic prior to AWS implementing it. Um, you can now take the same sort of logic and apply it inside of your eucalyptus cloud. You can do it inside of cloud.com. You can do it inside of RightScale and use scaling logic that you're already familiar with. Um, so those are the basic components, multi-cloud images, server templates, arrays, which are, you know, server templates called again and again, and you can wrap all of those things into a nice little customizable run it anytime type macro. And a macro, basically, we'll take a look at this, it's just a series of JavaScript commands that uh, talk to the particular API that you're pointing at um, to uh, start your application, right? And we structured these so that when our end users run, run them, they can uh, do a couple things, right? We'll up a base project here, uh, cloud group, uh, deployment, a demo environment, create a basic user in our environment. We want to start certain types of services, yes or no, we'll say yes. Database size, 10 gigabytes, MongoDB, sure or not. Big do I want those to be? And these are things where basically what we deal with are uh, not completely non-technical users. A lot of uh, the IT group uh, at EA, our end users are developers. So they're technical folks, but maybe they're just not infrastructure savvy, right? Like they know maybe I need 10 more web servers in my application, but they don't know how we can figure out that or what Apache module is going to answer, right? So we want to give them control over some of these things. And again, what we build really depends um, macros basically allow you to, with some inputs, build an entire deployment that's ready to go, push up a button, and uh, in our model, that ends up being uh, what, we, the, the, what we turn over, not what we try to get. So, I know that was a lot to cover very quickly, but any questions? Sure. Uh, so write scripts, um, we'll take a look uh, 
right here. In fact, a really good example of that is in our MySQL cluster here. We've had some real problems with our particular Puppet implementation and having it be nimble and flexible enough for what we're doing in cloud. Um, so one of the things that we do in this write script, for example, is let's see, a five puppet profile. I'm not sure, well, see what I can show in here. Um, we take a lot of the things that Puppet does and we basically export them into this type of script. You can also use a write script, for example, to uh, drop your Puppet configuration in a place where Puppet knows to look for it or to kick off that process. Uh, <coughs> most of what we've done um, is for our external cloud purposes, we've kind of veered away from Puppet, um, but uh, part of the reason we've used right on the framework is it's really easy to integrate back in when you decide to run that. All right. show you uh, isn't tied to that, which is kind of, uh, I guess, something that would be really different compared to uh, what we'd expect from a traditional vendor. So Cloud Foundry is Apache 2 license. Uh, it's not the sticky TTL or something else. Uh, you can customize it and do whatever you like with it. Uh, it's platform as a service. Uh, it lets you uh, deploy code up to the service and begin using it. Uh, it's available in numerous different ways, which is something I'm actually going to show you uh, right now. Uh, so, uh, as with Google App Engine and several other platforms as a service, you can push your code up to the cloud and just use it. Uh, in my case, uh, the first thing I'm going to show you is what's called uh, Micro Cloud Foundry. This is a free download uh, available from uh, off of cloudfoundry.com slash micro. Uh, it's a virtual machine. You can download it. Uh, there are probably six or seven configuration steps you just uh, walk through. And you can have your own platform as a service run to that, running inside of a single VM. And you can push uh, code to it and, and use it. So that's actually what I'm going to do right now. Uh, so we can pretend that I set this virtual machine up from scratch. Uh, that usually takes about eight, or eight to ten minutes. So that would have used up my time, hence the cooking show model. So then you use this uh, command line. This is the VMC tool. Uh, VMC is the command line tool. There are also uh, plugins for Eclipse uh, and uh, Spring SPS. Uh, you target your, uh, your cloud. Uh, this also, by the way, is open source. It's part of the, uh, uh, part of the open source stuff. So it's, a, it's a Ruby based. Uh, it does run on Windows, Linux, and obviously Mac, which is what I'm using. Uh, if I do a VMC target, you see I targeted the, the cloudfoundry.me, which lines up with, uh, with this API uh, up here. You'll see I did this VMC apps command. It shows me that I have no running applications right now. And so uh, I'm just going to uh, create an app. This is just going to be a very simple uh, Ruby app. 
going to be a few lines of code. So I'm telling it to use uh, the RubyGems repo. There's a web framework uh, called Sinatra. It's very basic. Um, and I'm telling it uh, to do a very basic hello world here. Let's save that. Let's see, look here. see, there's the file. I'll do DMC push. That doesn't matter. That's one of the awesome things about this. So you'll see I'm just fitting the default. These are all default services. It's asking if I want to find services. Uh, those are things like uh, databases, uh, message queues, anything like that. And so if I take uh, if I take the name off of this URL here. Well, that's cool, but that's running inside of a virtual machine. What if I wanted to make it available to everyone? So that's where things really get interesting. So uh, VMware hosts uh, CloudFoundry.com, uh, and so I can retarget CloudFoundry.com. Here, if I do my uh, VMC app, you'll see I have several apps already running. So again, if this was a more complex uh, application, I could incorporate other things uh, such as MongoDB, MySQL, uh, RabbitMQ, whatever, whatever I really chose. Uh, so you'll see it's started the app already. If I hop over here, I'm going to go here, and there it is. So it's, it's really that easy. Now, so that's great. Both of these uh, technically are VMware. Uh, we have another. Uh, we have several other partner clouds that run Cloud Foundry derived code, so I'm going to uh, target the partner cloud as well. This is actually uh, based on uh, app log, uh, and we're going to push up again. Languages that are supported are not just Ruby, uh, Java, Node.js. Um, there are, depending on which cloud you go, if they've chosen to support some of the other languages that are in the open source uh, that are available if you uh, pull it off of GitHub, uh, include uh, PHP, Python, Erlang. Uh, we have two partners that have announced uh, .NET support uh, as well. Um, and I would bet in the next few months we'll have covered <coughs> really all of the major languages that are pretty popular out there uh, today. Um, like I said, you can give it a try. It's free. It has uh, no dependencies as far as you can install it on bare metal gear. All you need is something that's capable of running uh, Ubuntu 64-bit. Uh, you can run it on AWS. You can run it on Rackspace. You can run it on VMware. CloudFoundry.com runs on VMware's infrastructure. Big surprise, right? But virtual machines you can run it on any kind of virtualization you choose. It, it doesn't have any dependencies. Uh, and you can scale up apps. There's something else I can show you. Uh, if I retarget, I'll retarget the, the CloudFoundry. So if I wanted to uh, hypothetically uh, scale my Hello World app, you'll see this number uh, column here. Uh, and somewhere, there it is. There's my app. So to scale, I can do VMC instances. Let's bring it up to three. That 
So today, there are not a lot of metrics you can directly get unless you're running it yourself, in which case you can, there's a dashboard and some other things that you could implement and look at. Um, uh, realistically, everything operates on a request per second basis, um, so you can calculate how many requests per second. The cool thing is you can dive all the way into the code, you can customize it, um, like I said, you can deploy it yourself or use something like cloudfoundry.com as we move toward the 4K model, we'll start to offer a lot more things like that. Uh, right now, since it's in beta, it's free, so a little bit limited on that side, but if you were running slow, you can see it's pretty fast to spin up additional instances to use. Um, so I have two questions. When you spun up multiple instances, is this basically spanning your application in multiple virtual machines and then having a load balancer in front? Or? That's correct. So there's a load balancer, there's a load balance uh, routing mesh uh, that uh, fans out across uh, different either virtual machines, physical machines, whatever it happens to be. Uh, so uh, you can spin up uh, and have it load balanced, and even if you end up with the same app deployed uh, against the same machine, so say you only have five nodes that you could deploy across, uh, it would evenly distribute across the five before it starts doubling up. So you can even distribution pretty much in other way. Uh, and there's one last question. Ubuntu is, uh, is what the code's built to run on right now. So it has to be capable of doing that, but that could be anything. That could be Zen, that could be KVM, that could be, you name it, it, it doesn't matter. So my name is Nathaniel Elliott. I'm <coughs> the sole ops engineer at InfoChimps. Um, I manage about 60 servers. Um, I learn, I learn uh, <coughs> and then a whole bunch of really smart programmers uh, who want insane things out of these servers. Um, the tool that really enables all of this for me is uh, Cluster Chef, which is a specialization of Chef. Um, how, many, how many of you are familiar with Chef? Okay. Uh, I'll do a real brief overview for those of you who aren't. It's uh, configuration management. Um, it's written in Ruby. It's got a cloud service uh, for the server side portion, or you can run a API compatible server. It's actually a different code under the hood. Um, and it aims to automate a whole lot of the 
processes that you currently do manually as an offset. Um, now, because of that, it's very agnostic about how you use it. It's got a lot of different ways that you can approach Chef. Cluster Chef is kind of our specialization on it, um, specifically for our needs, but also for the more general use case where you're pretty much facing using only public facing clouds. Um, now, that said, it has the capability of using other clouds. Under the hood, it uses fog IO, so in theory, you can target just about any cloud in practice. We haven't had much of that uh, done, though we're starting to work on local vagrant instances. So, get this going before I forget. So, uh, Gordo is our Elasticsearch cluster. It's still in development. Um, I paused to work on our scraper structure because our old scrapers were kind of having problems and we decided we would prefer to upgrade rather than try and patch the old things. Um, and these, I can't show you some of the internals of, I'm going to show you the elastic search instead, but uh, all of these are defined in the same kind of structure and they are deploying a bunch of event machine scrapers that, as you can see down here, um, I've collected just a, a quick find on the results to make sure that they're still working. Um, uh, so this is the final structure that we I had to kind of wrestle with uh, to get stuff going. Um, the core of it is the cookbook itself, um, that's the core of Chef itself. Uh, where Cluster Chef differs a little is that, especially in this most recent edition, we enforce uh, more, more standardization in the attributes. Um, I'll get to why in just a minute. Um, and then we've got the various recipes that for instance, lay down the client for uh, Elasticsearch if you just need to call into it. Uh, you can call in by uh, just straight HTTP call, but <coughs> I like the library. Um, a couple of different ways you can choose to install it um, and plug in and registering with the load balancer, etc. Um, and some templates to get all the various things in place on disk. And then up here we have the core of Cluster Chef, which is the Cluster DSL. And we've got stuff talking about how we're going to load it into EC2. We've got an environment definition, which I, in preparing, realized I probably should have it defaulting to uh, staging and manually pushing servers into production. Um, this is kind of a moving target. Um, and then we set some roles that are just going to happen on every node in the cluster. Um, and then we start defining facets. Now this only has one facet, but you can easily split a large cluster <coughs> of different types of functionality out using these facets. Um, because you can define roles and recipes within the facet. And the nice thing is this is actually a programmable environment. So you can start saying things like, I've got three nodes, and down here, I want to recover after I have two-thirds of my nodes off. Um, and then this information is all pushed into the running instances, um, which we think already have. Uh, okay. So it's pushed into the running instances um, somewhere in here. Um, the, under the hood, it does a sync. That sync you can also do manually if you change things in the config file. Um, and the advantage of doing this is that it allows you to have all of your infrastructure definition in one place, which is version control. Now, this is an ideal rather than an absolute, even in our case. Um, but that gets you 90 to 95% of the way to repeatable infrastructure, which is one of the awesome things about my job is that I went from working on 
how do we think about getting to reviewable infrastructure to, I just have to beat some heads and I might have it. <laughs> so, uh, it sets up and uh, labels all the EC2 servers, um, and it gets them launched, and then I should be able to log into them. some extra syntactic sugar here because I'm, ooh, okay, they haven't come up fully yet. Um, so either they're still converging or I have to figure out what bug is in their convergence process and rescue them. Um, I was hoping to have it up before my time ran out. But uh, in practice, it's not much longer than this to get a cluster up and running. Um, and in fact, if I could show you the inside of Nico, I could, probably could have brought up Nico as well. Any questions? <laughs> That's kind of hard to say because a lot of it is in the old infrastructure and I'm recapitulating in the new infrastructure so I haven't hit the snags yet. Um, Hadoop. Hadoop, we can't, through Cluster Chef itself, get things to start in quite the right order so that they don't take forever to figure out that they're all in the same cluster. So in practice, we start some things, <coughs> and then we run the uh, formatter, and then we start some more things. And it's three, four lines of manual process rather than the nice single lining that I had up at the top cluster launch. Um, my aim is to bring it back down as close to a single line as possible with the use of run depth. But that's kind of a down the line version forward thing, probably, uh, at least for external. We have, Crowbar has the same problem where you have to do single variables. Slightly couple, but. You, should, you and Flip should probably sit down and talk, because he banged his head against that for a couple of years and produced some really powerful stuff. Um, any other questions? Okay, I'll get out of here. Agents can 
configured for the appropriate uh, configuration. For instance, here we see that we have um, one image configured with just .NSDK and one configured with Visual Studio. Certain types of projects require Visual Studio on the build machine, others just require the, uh, the SDK. And so the different configuration, um, which is saved as an EC2 instance, is spun up on demand. Okay, so the, the engineers are doing lots of programming, mm -hmm. checking in, and this build cluster is automatically checking source control every time someone does a check-in, and then kicking off the automated build using the build cluster that's, that's up in the cloud. Okay. The, uh, each instance is configured with Amazon EC2 using, of course, the, uh, the, the access key and the secret access key. And um, we, we put all this into Team City, and it controls when it's necessary to spin up and, and EC2 instance and when it's necessary to terminate. Of course, we can figure, um, I, I increased it to 400 minutes just for the demo so it wouldn't spin them down because it's after hours and everything. Um, we typically keep it at 30 minutes, okay? Now, on Amazon EC2, uh, for the build cluster, <coughs> here is the account. We have, we have a few that you can see here. We keep all of them in the same uh, availability zone, because if we didn't, there'd be a lot of data traffic charges according to the way EC2 policy works, okay? Um, one of them at one point got misconfigured and I uh, didn't show up on the bill, and of course that reaches my attention and I asked, hey, what happened? Um, but even so, it's, it's, uh, it's three figures as far as the monthly expense. It doesn't even reach a thousand dollars for Now, that's the build cluster, and to take the software up to some test environments and then further, uh, we like to use Rackspace Cloud for test environments for the developers. And instead of developers having to project how many servers they need for the year, um, instead we give them a scalable account where um, they can decide, you know what, for the next three weeks we really need a test environment for X. Okay, let me just let me just log on here, click a few buttons, spec out my server, boom, I've got it. And then they don't have to come ask me for something that's really a trivial administrative thing. And as long as we save them the budget, I'm happy. They have their flexible computing environments for any number of test environments they need without having to allocate servers or we'll call it the more traditional hosting company. Okay? And so, um, you know, as far as for test environments, images, I think this will come up. Um, for images, you can have, on Rackspace Cloud, you can have daily and weekly server images. So if something goes wrong, you just roll back that server to what it was yesterday. As well as more frequent uh, backups to a SQL server or whatever you might have on there. Mm -hmm. For basic monitoring, um, for these types of things that are, not, that are not production in nature, we found it handy lately to use a product called Reveal Cloud Pro from Copper Egg and so you can see sort of, uh, you just install a tiny little program on the server and it sends out some information and then there's one dashboard that says, hey, uh, you know, how the server's going to use this space. Um, it's kind of inconvenient when you have one of these <coughs> cloud server images run out of disk space because sometimes you can't even get a remote connection if it's out of disk space and then what do you do? Now, if, oh, is anyone there? Yeah. Um, so, if anyone has any sort of open source software that you're working on, there is a free open source build cluster of Team City that's actually sponsored by JetBrains, the creators of Team City. And you can go to teamcity.codebetter.com. And anyone heard of Inhibernate? So the build, all the builds for Inhibernate are hosted here as well as in Ant and a lot of other projects that you've probably heard of. And so if you have an open source project, you can get onto this build cluster for free. If I page up a few times, page down a few times, you can see that there's quite a few open source projects that are hosted on, uh, on this build cluster. So, have time? <laughs> You're just there. Great, thank you very much. <laughs>
instrument. And uh, today I'm going to talk about my letters to Santa uh, with a backup presentation, so it's not on the slide deck yet. Um,
Uh, and for the hell of it, you know, I have a, a naughty and nice list. Uh, Santa, you know, Christmas time. So, you know, this this is a silly application I wrote. I'm posting it on my computer over here, but I'm gonna see, you know, if I'm naughty and nice this year. <coughs> so I'll get find out, and something might show up on my phone. Sweet. It says, you know, good job this year. Uh, way to be nice. <laughs> uh, and I have Ernest's phone number with me because, you know, I work with this kid. Uh, so if I want to... <laughs> uh, I think that's right. Yes. That's right. And, uh, you know, hopefully Ernest gets a message as well. What does it say? Sorry, nothing uh, for you this year. Be nicer next year. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Tony, man. Um, but yeah, any questions? <clears throat> so, I mean, what about overload control? How do you prevent from overloading a carrier's SMSD with, uh, you know, spam or, you know, kind of, uh, um, One of the things, that's, that's a great question. So one of the things that Twilio does is you actually have to sign up for an account. Uh, and, you know, every, every text message that's sent out, it's like a send one send text message kind of thing, so you have to pay for all of this stuff. Why is the resolution so <laughs> um, I can't actually scroll to the, the right hand side of the screen, but it's like one send a phone call, you know, one send a text. So somebody is actually creating all of these applications, so somebody has to put all of those bills. Um, and so if someone's abusing your app or some you can write custom logic behind the scene, but if someone's abusing your app you're actually going to be charged for all of that, so you got to be kind of careful about things like that. But they also provide you APIs for, um, you know, for account management and stuff like that. So if you have customers, if you have, you know, a lot of people using your application and you have your own custom accounts, you can actually kind of segment them into, hey, this is all kind of going into one account. So a little bit of control uh, from that perspective. Any other questions? Cool. Oh. Thank 
Facebook.com slash EMI, uh, you go to my GitHub account, um, and you'll be able to just go into the parameters. Uh, again, I'm sorry about the uh, but you choose your touch name, uh, the version, um, the cluster size, yes. Um, and then these are uh, interface uh, back uh, in uh, January, I believe the 17th, is that correct? Uh, January 17th, uh, Canonical is speaking. Uh, they do all sorts of cool uh, cloud stuff with Ubuntu. And 